The concept of a werewolf or wolfman is a pretty common one. We often associate them with the classic Universal Monster movies of the 50s and 60s. These creatures have long moved on from being feared and are now looked at as fanciful interpretations of old European stories. In fact, they do belong to the same category as, well, Frankenstein, the Invisible Man, and Dracula, but have you ever stopped to think about how horrifying the idea of a wolfman actually is? Imagine a part man, part wolf hybrid confronting you on a quiet forest road. Would you find yourself entertained? I would guess that you would probably be scared to death when faced with such a savage creature. Well, today, we'll be moving away from the fantasy depiction of the Wolfman and be discussing a lesser-known cryptid of North America. We will be discussing the Dogman. Dogman, otherwise known as the Beast of Bray Road in the Midwest, is a topic we have discussed quite a bit. But today, we'll be covering some eyewitness accounts of this terrifying creature and analyzing the habits and common traits in each of these accounts. But before we begin, let me simply refresh your minds on what a dogman is, in case you're new to the concept. This cryptid, sometimes referred to as the Michigan Dogman, is a creature that was first seen in the late 19th century. Several witnesses in Wexford County, Michigan, saw a creature they described as seven foot tall, blue-eyed or amber-eyed, a bipedal canine-like animal with a human torso. Now, these witnesses also reported that the howl of a dogman sounded similar to a human screeching. It's interesting that the eye color of the creature appears to change from account to account. I've read some that are red eyes, other amber, others yellow, and some blue. Some speculate that the creature can change its eye color to suit the current situation. It can appear amber-eyed to ward off other creatures, or maybe it can appear more human-like to potentially lure an unsuspecting victim. The legend of the Dogman has struck fear into the hearts of many campers and residents of Michigan and the surrounding states. Stories of the Dogman are commonly told around campfires, and reports of sightings are spread all around as local legends. Tonight, we have a couple of encounters that will surely send chills down your spine. I would invite you all to put yourself in the place of the witnesses in these encounters. Imagine how you would react when confronted by an unknown horror right in front of your very eyes. It could be easy to imagine that you would be brave and go after the creature, but after tonight's tales, I'm sure you will be able to understand why so many of these witnesses ran the other way. The first witness account is one of the most famous stories associated with the cryptid. In 1936, a man by the name of Mark Shackleman was working for the St. Coletta Convent in the city of Racine. Racine borders Illinois and is a pretty small town. Mark was assigned to be the night watchman for the convent. His nights were usually not very exciting, and he mostly paced back and forth around the perimeter of the convent and waited for his shift to be over. Located next to the convent was a graveyard for some of the indigenous people that had lived in the area. The graveyard was quite close to the convent, but Mark was instructed to stay on the church property while he was on shift during his perimeter. One night, Mark was walking around the graveyard with his lantern when he noticed something kneeling over one of the graves. Not wanting to leave the grounds of the church, Mark tiptoed to the edge of the perimeter and tried to get a closer look at who or what was next to the grave of this indigenous person. As his eyes focused more, Mark's heart dropped because Mark could clearly see that what looked like a tall creature with long dark fur and claws was scratching at one of the graves and he smelt this distinct odor of death when he looked at this thing. Not wanting to abandon his duties, but too curious to let the creature go, Mark simply walked towards the burial ground. And before he could get too close, however, the creature noticed Mark and took off running into the woods. Mark knew that the creature was too big to be a wolf, and he was left scratching his head as to what he had seen. I mean, at this time, no one had any idea that these kinds of things existed at least in our society. Mark returned to his post and tried to shake off what he had seen from his mind. After all, he was hired to protect the church, not chase after frightening beasts. The next day, before his next night shift, 
Mark returned to the burial plot to see if he can find any signs of the creature from the night before. He could clearly see large footprints that matched no animal that he had ever tracked. They looked somewhat like wolf prints, but they were too long, and they looked too human to be any wolf in that area. Mark decided to get a closer look at the grave that he had seen the creature kneeling over. The grave was unmarked, so Mark was unable to figure out who was resting six feet below him, but he could clearly see scratch marks on the headstone. He could see clear marks from some of the claws, but the other marks were indicative of a withered hand, something Mark was unable to see when he first observed the creature. That night, during his shift, Mark made his usual rounds around the perimeter of the convent as usual, and he was eager to focus on his work. And although he was curious as to what the creature was, he wasn't quite sure that he wanted to know. I mean, after all, would you? Mark had a calm night until a few hours went by, and he began to hear a scratching sound coming from the graveyard right near him. Mark wanted to run, but his curiosity had got the best of him, and he heads towards the noise. Even before he got to the burial ground, he could smell the stench of that same stinking rotting flesh, the same stench as the night prior. As the graveyard comes into view, Mark clearly sees the creature kneeling over the same grave. Mark approached the creature, expecting it to do what it did last time and run into the woods like it did before. But to his surprise, the creature turns towards him and stood up straight. This creature was almost seven feet tall and it looked at Mark with its piercing amber eyes and growled at him. Mark was simply frozen in place. He had not expected to confront the creature, and he was sure that this was something he had never seen. This thing stood like a man, but yet it looked like a wolf. Its matted fur was glistening in the moonlight, and then after staring at Mark for what felt like an eternity, the creature did something that Mark would never have expected. The creature spoke to him. Gadara. That was the only word this creature said to Mark. At this point, Mark was ready to get away from what he was seeing and return back to his normal life. The creature sneered at Mark and held its ground. He began to pray for courage to stand up to this thing, and then Mark turned away and walked back towards the convent. The creature kept its eyes on him as he walked away, but did not give chase. Mark was free from the grips of this terrifying beast and he was relieved to be over with this terrifying encounter. Mark never saw the creature again for the remainder of his time that he worked for the convent, but he often smelt that same stench of rotting flesh that accompanied this creature, otherwise known as a dogman. Was the creature watching him from the shadows, waiting for a moment to strike? It's safe to say that Mark Shockman was glad to never find out. One lingering mystery of this eyewitness account is the word that the dogman spoke. Gadara is not a common word, nor does it have any common meaning. Some speculate that this is the actual name of the dogman and that it was letting Mark know who he was dealing with. Maybe it's a remnant of an ancient language that is no longer used. Maybe it has biblical ties. This word has puzzled the minds of cryptozoologists and paranormal researchers for decades, and we're still searching for a satisfactory answer. If you have any connection to this word or know what it might be or what it could possibly be referring to, please reach out to me in the comments. I would be happy to read any information any of you could provide. Now, our next eyewitness account comes from Paris, Michigan. A man by the name of Robert Forney who was fishing on the Muskegon River one summer day. He was 17 at the time, and fishing was one of his few pastimes. I mean, in 1938, there wasn't a whole lot of hobbies, so people took pride in simpler things. Life was simple after all, and Robert enjoyed fishing, and he was fortunate to be able to fish all day long. The area by the river wasn't always the safest, however. Wild dogs were known to show up in packs looking for a snack, and Robert knew this, so he always carried his rifle with him, in case things got a little sticky. But he was lucky, lucky enough to only have spotted these creatures a few times, and they never really gave him any real trouble. I mean, after all, Robert was fishing the day away like he had planned to and didn't see any real reason to run into trouble. There were plenty of fish biting that day, and Robert was completely content just sitting back and enjoying the nature around him. This particular day, though, 
nature just so happened to come a little too close and personal with Robert. As Robert reeled in his latest catch, he noticed a couple of shapes moving through the tall grass around him. Robert put down his fishing rod, grabs for his rifle. His instincts would prove to be correct as soon as he saw a pack of wild dogs creeping out of the tall grass. The pack began walking towards him, growling at him as they advanced. Robert, who fired a warning shot in the air, hoping to scare up the creatures, since there were six dogs that came for Robert, and once they all heard the shot, all but one of them fled. The remaining creature stood in its place, only ten feet away from Robert, and just stared at him. Robert stood stunned at what he was seeing, and the creature was larger than any other dogs and seemed to have no fear of the weapon held in Robert's hand. And then the creature smiled at him. Robert froze as he stared at the savage grin on the beast's face. He had never seen a wild dog do this, and the piercing blue eyes of the animal stayed trained on him as he readied his gun again. Robert mustered up the courage to fire another warning shot. This time, the creature fled. And as the creature fled, Robert saw that it did not hurry away on all fours. But instead, it ran away bipedally, or on two feet, like a man. Robert Fortney could not have known how lucky he was. I mean, after all, he had not brought a weapon with him, and he would have likely suffered some terrible fate. But he never did see those creatures again, and he counted himself very lucky for that. One commonality between both of the accounts that we've discussed today is the creature's desire to stare down the witness. It's almost a taunting mechanism. It is unknown why the creature chooses to observe its possible victims, perhaps the creature's judging, whether or not to reveal itself to the individual. The creature spoke to Mark Shackleman, but did not exchange any words with Robert Fortney. Perhaps the dogman is more human than we understand and is possibly seeking to communicate with others, similar beings. The next account is a rare case in which a photograph of the creature was taken, or allegedly taken. The reporter of this incident has chosen to remain anonymous for unknown reasons. The witness lived in the town of Big Rapids, Michigan. He was also a night security guard, much like the subject of our first account, but this witness was the night guard for a manufacturing plant right across the street from his own house. Both the witness's house and the manufacturing plant were located right next to the Hamish State game area, a place littered with several varieties of large animals. Perfect for a food source for a large alpha predator, right? Well, one night, the witness heard something making noise by the chain link fence surrounding the game area. Thinking that it was an intruder, the witness grabbed his gun for protection, and when the witness went to investigate the threat, he was shocked by what he saw. Instead of seeing a man or a common animal, the man saw a six-foot-tall grayish-brown canine walking upright in his driveway. Recognizing that what they were seeing was something truly remarkable, the witnesses ran back indoors to find their camera. Hoping to take a picture of the creature, the witnesses run back outside, but the creature had now moved out of the witness's driveway and into the dark street. Although he could barely see the creature, the witness was able to capture a few photos of it passing underneath a street lamp. The creature seemed to either have not noticed the witness or chose to ignore him altogether. The witness should be thankful he did not have an encounter with such a horrifying beast. The alleged dog man ran off into the night before the witness could capture more footage. But the few photographs that remain capture a little bit of what the dog man looks like, supposedly. And while the photos are blurry and hard to make out, you could clearly see the image of something large roaming the streets of Big Rapids, Michigan. Now, this next encounter is remarkable as it is the first time that we have ever heard of the dogman stalking a witness over an extended period of time. This witness is also anonymous, and his account takes place in Grand Rapids, Michigan. The first time the witness saw the creature was back in 1988 when he was in grade school. He was playing a game of hide and seek during recess time, which was a typical game that he and his friends played almost daily. The witness was tired of constantly being found first, so he decided he would bend the rules of the game a little bit. 
Instead of staying on the school property, he would head off into the woods next to the playground and stay far away from the rest of the kids. He walked the woods for a couple of minutes until he made his way next to some train tracks by a river. Now, certain that he would never be found, he sits down to catch his breath, and while the slow river flowed, the witness began playing with rocks and sticks around him, and he throws a few stones in the river and enjoys the splashing sounds they made as they, as they sunk into the water. And as this young boy hurled stones into the water, he hears a big splash just a little ways away from him. The splash, sounding so big, startles him, and he looks over to investigate the source of the sound. And the boy saw a nearly eight-foot-tall being bolting into the woods from where he had come from. The witness described the creature as having dark fur and switching between running on four legs and two. And the description is also consistent with the other accounts that we have examined today. Fearing for his safety, the boy runs straight home into his bed. He didn't tell anybody about what he had seen until later on when he was an adult. Sure, he could be fabricating the whole thing, but what's his incentive? He didn't want fame, that's for sure. And by this time, he was also more familiar with the wildlife around him and was certain that the creature that he had seen was nothing like what was common in the area. He says the creature looked almost like a timber wolf, but was more humanoid and had much longer legs. The second encounter with the dogman that this witness had occurred in 2008, a full 20 years after the first incident. The man now had a family and was sleeping soundly in his bed when he was awoken to the sound of a thud on his roof. The man was immediately reminded of his initial encounter with the dogman, and he had a feeling that whatever was on his roof was related to what he had seen all those years ago. He grabs a machete from his garage to protect himself and headed outside to confront the beast. As he headed out into his yard, the same creature that the man had seen 20 years ago poked its head out from the top of the roof and stared at him. The creature then leapt from the roof and bolted towards the tree line. When the dogman reached the tree line, it stands up on two legs and just stares at him. The man froze, staring back at this beast, and they looked at each other for a full minute before the man worked up the courage to run up to this thing with a machete, going to attack it. As he ran towards the creature, it began to smile at him, and when the man approached the dogman, it spoke a single word to him. The man stopped in his tracks and felt a strange sense of calm wash over him as this creature backed into the woods with some sort of supernatural power. The witness never saw this thing again. This is the second time we have heard of the dogman speaking to someone. It appears to be capable of saying multiple things, but it chooses to only speak a single word to a person confronting it. It seems as though the dogman recognized the man from all those years ago. The grin that the creature gave him seems to possibly indicate that this dogman was aware with who he was dealing with. His cryptic advice of don't could be taken in one of two ways. Perhaps the dogman was scared of fighting with the man, or maybe the dogman was sparing the man from getting into a battle that he knew he would lose. Either way, the dogman spoke again and ran off into the night. This next account takes place in Elkhorn, Michigan. This time, the creature was spotted on Bray Road. This stretch of road would become the origin for the other name of the dogman, the Beast of Bray Road. It was a dark fall night at around 1.30 a.m., and Lori and Drizzy was driving from her job. She was a manager at an Elkhorn Lodge and often worked later nights. She had just gotten off her shift, and she was ready to jump into bed and get some well-deserved sleep. She was tired. She was driving down this dark country road, blasting the car radio so she can try and keep herself from dozing off when she spots something unusual on the side of the road. Lori only occasionally saw a deer on Bray Road and was taken by surprise at the sight of such a large animal. She had driven this route hundreds of times and had never seen anything so large or remarkable, but tonight was different. She slows down and approaches the animal with her car, and as she grew closer to the creature, she could only really point out its short, pointed ears. The creature was facing away from her and was kind of kneeling down, so she couldn't quite grasp the size of the animal. As Lori grew even closer, however, the creature turned and showed its face to her, and it looked like a canine but didn't look like any dog or wolf Lori had ever seen of. 
The creature had its elbows up, and Laura could see that it had long claws at the end of its hands. It looked to be about maybe seven feet and was larger than any animal she had ever seen, let alone just on Bray Road. Lori was expecting this thing to run away, as any other wildlife would have, but instead, the creature stares directly into her eyes from outside her car, and Lori feels chills all over her body. Although she knew she was looking at an animal, her brain couldn't comprehend it. She couldn't help but feel that there was something distinctly human in its eyes. She felt there was something satanic about the creature staring her down, and she just felt she needed to get away as fast as possible. This wasn't a case of being scared of something we don't understand. She genuinely felt evil, the presence of evil from this thing. And as she drove away from the dogman, she noticed that it was carrying roadkill in its hands. In its hands, not paws. Lori drove away and did her best to avoid Bray Road on her nightly drives back from her job at the Elkhorn Lodge. Bray Road would also go on to become notorious for sightings of dogmen and would later give the creature its very infamous popular name. Lori would go on to report the sighting to animal control at the time. I mean, she had no idea how to describe the creature that she had seen, and there was no box that even remotely came close to an accurate description, right? Lori would file the report as having witnessed a werewolf. The animal control officers laughed when they first saw the request came through. I mean, what would you think? They had seen a lot of crazy animals in their day, but they assumed that the report sitting on their desk had to be a joke or a prank. They were shocked when they saw several other werewolf sightings come in over the next several years, though, and the Animal Control Division kept careful watch over Bray Road and the surrounding woods, because now it was turning into something far more serious, but could never spot the elusive beast. The dogman sightings are still reported in the area to this very day, and the road has become infamous for the horrific tales that accompany this seemingly innocuous stretch of forest in Elkhorn, Michigan. Now, our final eyewitness encounter is the most recent encounter of the group. This account also has a special distinction of being the only account that is not from Michigan. Duluth, Minnesota is a town just outside the border of Wisconsin. It sits on the west side of Lake Superior and is your average Great Lakes town. Our last witness also wished to remain anonymous. On November 7th, 2016, this person was driving down Maple Grove Road. It was a dark and cold night, and Maple Grove Road lay just on the border between the residential and rural areas of Duluth. Our witness was out for a drive, listening to the radio, and trying to get her mind off of all the troubles that she had in her life when she saw something walking underneath a lamppost on the side of the road. Curious as to who or what the figure was, she slows down and tries to get a closer look. She was barely able to make out a large creature, nearly seven feet tall, with a wolf-like face, a large snout, and a short pointed ears hunched over near the lamp. She couldn't believe what she was saying. I mean, could you? This witness was more aware of the legends of the dogman and she could not shake the feeling that the creature she was seeing was the one that she had heard whispers of growing up. Just as she moved in closer to get a better look, the creature runs off on all fours to a nearby field. She couldn't help but notice that the creature moved awkwardly. It almost moved like a hunched over gorilla using its arms to support itself. Strange. As the creature ran deeper into the field and out of sight of the eyewitness, the terror of the situation finally hits her. She was terrified out of her mind and felt a cold feeling coming from the creature. It was as if her body knew that she had just escaped a terrible fate and was now dealing with all the shock at once. The witness did not feel safe anymore. She quickly got back in her car to flee the area where she had been and seen the beast. Why you would ever get out of your car after seeing such a thing is beyond me. But she drove to a well-lit gas station, calls her husband. I mean, she wanted to be surrounded by light and people because she was worried this creature would return for her. I mean, can you blame her? She could feel something, though, in the back of her mind telling her that she was being stalked by someone. And she was not eager to find out who it was. As she waited at the gas station for her husband to come comfort her, she tried to process more what she had seen. This witness, fortunately, was a graphic designer, and she knew that she had to document what she had seen. 
After her and her husband drove back to their home, the designer would go on to sketch what she had seen so she could always be on the lookout for the same horrifying creature. The fear that accompanied the creature was something that the witness had never felt. She could feel a physical shift in the air after seeing this thing. Now, she described this feeling as a thick black sludge hanging over her as she sat in her car at the gas station. The strength of this feeling made the witness know that what she had seen was something unnatural, something terrifying. She knew that any creature that could command such a dark and awful feeling was something she never wanted to see again. Luckily for the witness, though, she would never come face to face with this creature again, but someone close to her would and it would also share their own story of her experience with the horrifying creature. Now, after a few weeks of constantly seeing the creature's strange face in her mind, the witness decided to tell her family about her encounter. She knew she might sound a little crazy, but her family had faith in her and knew that she could trust them. When she told her family about what she had seen, describing the creature in as much detail as she could muster, her sister chimed in with a story of her very own. Turns out, her sister said that she had seen the exact same creature that the eyewitness described years earlier when the entire family lived under the same roof. She said that she was staying up late one night and everybody else in the house was asleep. She was getting ready to head off to bed and her eyes wandered to the windows that lined the back side of the house. When she looked out, she could see two red dots in the distance right near the tree line. Although the sight of two red dots made her a little uneasy, she decided to continue staring at them to see if there was some sort of rational explanation to what she was seeing. Maybe her brothers had left something out in the yard that looked similar to what she was seeing and she was getting worried for nothing. As her eyes, though, began to adjust to the darkness, she noticed that those two red dots were attached to a much larger shape, a creature. She was seeing the exact same creature that her sister would later describe years ahead. And as she looked at this menacing thing, it stared back at her again. As we have seen in many of the accounts that we have covered tonight, the creature seems interesting in sizing up its prey before it does anything. The sister stared at the creature for several minutes, and the sister was paralyzed with fear. I mean, she could not think of anything that she could possibly do to help herself in that situation besides keeping an eye on the creature, hoping it would eventually run away. Fortunately for the sister, it did back away from the house and disappear into the tree line. The sister would never run into it again, although she was always vigilant for the return of the beastly creature. These two accounts also share an eerie similarity from the accounts we have covered. The dogman seems to be interested in staring down its victims, potentially judging their worthiness before either fleeing or striking. Maybe there's a pattern, maybe there's a reason. Perhaps all the accounts listed today are just a few of the lucky ones that have escaped alive. As you know, based on the content on my channel, I have a plethora of encounter stories from dogmen, dozens upon dozens of eyewitness sightings. I am sure that after knowing what I do, this creature is not always so eager to run away. And as we end tonight's video, I would encourage you all to stay on guard and be vigilant at all times. While this particular cryptid seems to have made its home around the Great Lakes and deep forest, there are many terrifying things we do not understand all around the world that could be a threat to any unsuspecting passerby. As I said earlier, if any of you have any information that could shed some light on the strange word that the dogman spoke in our first account, please feel free to comment any insights you might have. Oftentimes, information about these mystery beasts are kept with people who are too afraid to come forward with their own stories for fear of ridicule. Although it can be a little frightening, the entire community of people who are determined to discover more about these things would be eternally grateful to have more accounts of the creatures that they love to study. The Dogman, although one of America's lesser known cryptids in the grand scheme of things, is one of the most terrifying creatures that lurk in the shadows of the forest and around the Great Lakes. And unlike the common stories of werewolves found in European literature and folklore, this creature is much more real and mysterious and ultimately uh, terrifying. Thank you all for joining me on this strange and enlightening journey as we continue to cover more cryptids and strange events of the supernatural. I hope you will all share your own stories with the unexplained. First-hand accounts are often the best source of information for these many kinds of stories. If you enjoyed tonight's episode, be sure to go ahead and slap that like button and leave a comment down below. 
Also, if you're new to the channel, please go ahead and subscribe because it helps the channel grow and helps me create more entertaining content for you. As always, stay safe, everybody. I love you all, and I'll see you all in the next episode.